Welcome to all Hebrew University's friends to our webinar. I'm happy to share that today Viviana Goren Kassam, one of Hebrew University's closest friends from Italy and president of our Italian Friends Association Brain Circle Italy and Lugano, will moderate the webinar. Viviana founded and created Brain Circle Italy with Nobel Prize recipient Professor Rita Levi Montalcini with a goal to make the general public and youth in particular familiar with brain research. Viviana has been nominated Honorary Fellow of the Hebrew University, and for the past 10 years, she has been sitting on the Board of Governors of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Viviana, would you please kick off our much anticipated webinar? Well, thank you. Thank you, Mara and everybody. I just want to add to what you say that I'm a journalist, a scientific journalist uh, for a long time, working for the main Italian newspaper Corriere della Sera. And I was also one of the first journalists to write about women's situation and women fight uh, for equal opportunities. And so it seems that the seminar tonight joins my two interests together. And so I'm very happy to be here with all of you and with such uh, 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 great scientists uh, with us. Uh, now, why um, sex and gender difference in brain and mental health during the pandemic? Because uh, we um, have seen that among the many things that we now know about COVID, uh, there are also as many things we don't know. And one of them is the epidemiology. And really, it's very hard to understand why certain countries, certain cities, certain um, uh, places in, in cities are attained more than others. Why, for example, young people and children were not uh, touched very hardly in the first wave, but they are now. And especially the difference between men and women in reaction, not only to the COVID, but also to the, the vaccines. And what we saw at the beginning, it seems that women catch COVID less. But now in the second wave, no, it's almost 50-50. But still, women seem to have less serious cases of COVID and they die less than men, even though there are many more elderly women than men. And so you'd expect that it's a frailer population and they should be attained more seriously, more heavily and have a bigger number of deaths. So this we don't understand. Is it hormones? Is it the immune system? Is it the fact that women are more cautious? We will discuss all this tonight. And we will start with Professor Emona Sorek, who holds the Hebrew University Schlesinger Chair in Molecular Neuroscience and is also a founding member of our beloved ELSEC, the Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Brain Science. Hello, Mona, and now it's to you. Thank you, Viviana. And thank you also for urging me to recheck all of the publications about the difference between men and women with regards to COVID, which we've done last night, actually, just to be updated. So I appreciate your scientific uh, particular attention. So yes, we do see differences, but I need to add here that we see differences between men and women in many different diseases, not always to the same direction. Women are more sensitive for Alzheimer's disease. They deteriorate faster when they get sick. They are less sensitive than men to Parkinson's disease. And again, it is not yet clear why. Is it the incidence or the reaction? And as you said, Viviana, is, are these hormones or the genetics or the psychology? Perhaps women are more accustomed to get used to a tough situation than men. On the other hand, we do read in the literature that in all of humanity crisis, women suffered more than men in the long-term outcome of those events. And I'm concerned that we start to see that at the sociological level. So 
could these be complications that are unique to women? We've published a paper on the RNA regulators of COVID infection. And we can think about genes, RNA, and protein as three levels in a pyramid. We all share the same number of genes, but each of us carries genes with minute differences, which might affect our susceptibility to disease at the genetic level. Some say viral infection is not a genetic disease. True, the virus is not a genetic disease, but our reaction to a disease has a genetic background to it. So every disease has its impact of, on our genome. And of course, the if, uh, genome of women interacts with the hormonal state, with the age, with the exposure to other elements like routinely taken vitamins and drugs. And it is possible that vitamin D affects women better than men, which could be part of the uh, reported difference. The complications are something else. The secretary of our department had been infected with corona and she complains about a lot of post-infection complications. We do know that the virus also infects the brain. Otherwise people would not lose their capacity to smell or taste. So it is not surprising that many people report confusion, difficulties in memorizing, difficulties to focus and concentrate. And that might have long-term consequences that we are still starting just to study. We don't know yet the impact, the length, and the sex and gender differences in these uh, effects. So the molecular regulators would also be different. For example, uh, women are much more susceptible to pain-related diseases. In most of the diseases where the main aspect is pain, we find more women than men as the sufferers. And of course, one of the aspects of this infection is pain. So we do uh, expect the pain susceptibility perhaps to come out as an aftermath effect. Then there is perhaps more uh, a, a ready, readiness of women to share their feelings than men. Women might be more open to say, I suffer pain, I am very tired, I have mm -hmm. difficulties to memorize, whereas men, at least in the Israeli society, would be much more reserved in sharing their feelings. So I think that we need to respect both biology and genetics combined with the sociological rules of each society as elements that would implement the comparison between men and women in their response to the disease. The main problem I can see with that is that when drugs are developed, they are often or even almost always developed in male mice. And then they are tested in humans, but the initial phase of development is always in male animals alone, which is a major problem for women, not only with regards to this disease, but to any disease. And if we look at the instructions of the FDA, what do they check when a new drug is developed? Is it equal or better to the previous drug that had been developed for that disease? Now we are in a terra incognita. Nobody knows what are the drugs that would affect this disease, except maybe for Donald Trump who knows everything. <laughs> So I, I would stop here and leave the stage to others. Thank you again.
Thank you very much. I'm sure uh, we will uh, have more time to discuss it after. We will have some time for questions and for going into the problems more. So now I give uh, the, the screen to Shir Atzil. Shir is also from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She's a senior lecturer, Department of Psychology. And uh, uh, she did a postdoctoral research uh, at the IAS lab at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, Shear uh, will analyze for us uh, the uh, um, implications in uh, uh, the psychology of COVID, because COVID is not only a sickness of uh, the body, but it's also a sickness of the mind. The isolation, the, the fact that we had to have a lockdown was very hard, even for people who were not sick. And then uh, it is very important to see the impact of social isolation, uh, which is very different for men and women. So Shir, please explain to us. Thank you very much, uh, Viviana and the Women's Brain Project for organizing this uh, panel and important discussion. Uh, so I'm a scientist at the Department of Psychology at the Hebrew University. And in my lab, we study the neural and behavioral mechanisms of social bonds in humans. And today I want to start with a question. What makes us a social species? Humans are an extremely social species. Um, and sociality has been defined in many ways, including terms like group cooperation, um, maternal bonding, pair bonding, and monogamy. But today I want to define sociality in a new way as animals who simply cannot survive on their own. And they depend on other animals from their own species just to stay alive. So the evolutionary plan really relies on the presence of other uh, um, conspecifics in the environment and not only on the individual's physiology. All birds and mammals are social to some extent as newborns are completely helpless in staying alive. Uh, Shir, sorry if I interrupt you. Could you um, raise your volume? Some people are yeah. asking. You cannot hear me well? No, it's better. It's better now? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I will try to uh, speak loudly. So um, the newborns from mamas and birds, uh, they rely on a dedicated caregiver to regulate many aspects of their ongoing physiological balance, a term that I call allostasis. Um, and this includes their metabolism, their energy balance, their immune system, their temperature, their autonomic nervous systems, and so all mammals and birds are social or dependent um, at some point of their lives, but some highly social species, for example, humans, rely on others throughout their lifetime. And though they become more independent in regulating their physiology, allostasis is still optimized in groups. And we see this in animals that rely on conspecifics on other members from, their, from the species for hunting, for protection, um, and we also see this in the fact that social isolation or losing a loved partner is a robust predictor for illness and for uh, death. Um, in order to uh, ensure social regulation of allostasis, uh, every physiological need that the infant will experience will be socially communicated by the infant to the caregiver. And this dependency produces a very special learning environment in which the ultimate reward really, think about it, allostasis regulation, food, comfort, care, is always 100% statistical regularity, always presented with association with another human. And so the infant will never feed without the, without the presence of their caregiver. This special learning environment leads to two significant developmental outcomes. The first is that social information becomes increasingly more important and increasingly more rewarding than any other stimulus in the world, and babies gradually become attached to their caregiver. The second thing that happens is that the brain, which is basically in charge of controlling our bodily systems, learn that the only way for regulating metabolism is via social interaction. And so while uh, social regulation of metabolism is critical for survival in early life, in infancy, as social animals, we have learned 
our brains have developed to regulate our physiological processes through social means. And we do it throughout the lifespan. Many of our, our going regulatory processes um, are uh, processed, are done in social ways. We eat together, we sleep together, we rely on our close others for emotion regulation, for productivity and for our health. And thinking about humans as social animals, uh, that depend on one specifics for optimizing physiological regulation, we may understand the impact of social isolation on humans. Now, a PhD student in my lab, Lior Zeevi, decided to assess the effects of social isolation on self-regulation and well-being. The coronavirus shutdown um, is uh, a unique once-in-a-lifetime experience, hopefully, which offer the opportunity to capture and study people's feelings and experiences in an almost lab-like conditions of isolation. During the first lockdown in Israel, exactly last year, uh, where people were not uh, allowed to leave their homes at all for uh, almost five weeks, we collected video diaries where participants shared their daily experiences during the lockdown, including their eating and sleeping habits and their relationships. We included in our study three groups of participants, sig singles, couples, and parents with children. Now, our scientific approach in my lab is instead of asking people how they feel, we like to get this information from implicit cues in their spontaneous behavior. We took the video diaries and coded the second by second behavior in each subject, and the subjective regulatory state of the individual can be represented on this two dimensional space that I show you here. The horizontal axis, the valence axis, represents how good or bad a person feels. Displacement to the left on this axis can represent a deviation from balance, where uh, moving uh, right um, can represent re-regulation. The vertical axis can represent the amplitude of the shift, so there can be a minor deviation from allostasis balance or a very uh, dramatic shift, and this is also relevant for the right side of this space. And we use this tool to behaviorally code our participants um, in women and also in men. Here is an example of one of our diaries. Um, it is in Hebrew, so you probably don't uh, understand the content, but look how expressive this participant is. Um, and we code the second by second fluctuations in valence and arousal in, in the video diaries. And you can see here on the left how, how the coding is being done and how we can quantify really the very uh, um, uh, small gists uh, that represent uh, her, her ongoing regulatory state. Now, using this tool, there are many questions that we can ask. We can uh, rate the participants' well-being and self-regulation uh, by calculating the time the participant had spent on this side of the space compared to this side of the space. We can ask which regulation patterns are associated with relationships, uh, with loneliness, and with health, with uh, um, uh, different behaviors, uh, even health outcomes. And we can measure the gender differences in self-regulation during the lockdown. And when we did that, what we found was that under conditions of complete social isolation, in single people living by themselves, women are doing much better than men, showing improved patterns of self-regulation. In this graph, men are in turquoise and women are in orange. Um, and on the y-axis is the time participants were displaying positive affect during their video diary. And we see that women spend significantly more time in positive regulation than men. However, this is only true in singles. When we look at other groups as well, we see that men's affect remains relatively low regardless of their familial status. Women, however, are better regulated unless they have children, showing a significantly less positive regulation in mothers compared to single women. Surprisingly, we expected couples to be optimally regulated and we did not find that. Now, one of the problems in the COVID studies is that uh, we cannot get a matching control group since everyone were in lockdown and under stressful situation at the same time. However, when we uh, look at data we collected from parents just uh, uh, before the COVID, uh, we see that positive regulation scores of mothers during normal times average just below 80 and fathers at around 50. This points to the stressful consequences of the lockdown on both men and women. 
In addition to assessing the self-regulation in the diaries, we also conducted language analysis and scored the participants' health behaviors. For example, participants with poor behaviors have sleep and eating disturbances, and they do not engage in any kind of physical activity. Unlike them, participants with good health behavior reported to eat and sleep regularly. In this graph, the x-axis represents the health behaviors going from poor to bad, and the y-axis represents the positive regulation in the diary. And what we see here is that good health behaviors are associated with improved regulation only in women. We can see that the better the woman behaves, the more positively regulated she is, and we do not see this effect in men. Here, the x-axis the again is the health behavior and the y-axis is the number of COVID symptoms. We found that good health behaviors are associated with less COVID symptoms. Now being subjective measure, this reduced report of symptoms suggests either physical or mental resiliency during the pandemic. The lockdown affected not only the self-regulation of participants, but also their relationships. In this graph, the x-axis is the days in lockdown and the y-axis is the rating of the relationship satisfaction. We see that the longer periods of social isolation are associated with worsening of relationships. This time, this effect seems specific to men. We do see across both men and women that positive regulation is protective of relationships. So people who rated the relationships as better, right here on the right, had, uh, were more positively regulated uh, compared to people uh, who did not. Okay, so just to summarize, we are social animals. Lockdowns have adverse psychological, relational, and health outcomes with gender differences. Um, and these have potentially dramatic societal and economic consequences that should be considered. Um, as social species, humans depend on conspecifics for allostasis throughout their lifetime. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shia. That was very, very interesting. And I think it's a, a good way to lead the way to the next uh, talk by Anne-Marie Schumacher-Dimek, who is also a psychologist. She's a co-founder and president of the Women's Brain Project, which is a Swiss association that uh, uh, wants to expand the studies on sex, uh, sex differences and gender differences in medicine. They are very active, they do a fantastic work. And um, um, uh, Anne-Marie uh, is also uh, heads the pa um, a further education program in palliative care and in uh, healthcare and medical leadership at the University of Lausanne, uh, of Lausanne, sorry. Uh, and, uh, what I'd like to ask to uh, Anne-Marie in particular is the effect, uh, the practical effect on women in the way of uh, economic and social consequences that I think women, even in, if they are better in uh, confronting themselves with the lockdown, had much worse uh, consequences than men. Is that true? Thank you, Viviana. Thank you for the introduction. And in, indeed, um, uh, <laughs> that, that is what I would like to talk about in my, in my uh, contribution. But before I start, I would briefly like to say something about Women's Brain Project for those of you in the audience who may never have heard of us. Hopefully very few of you have never heard of us. Um, we're a group of scientists and uh, from various disciplines, medical doctors, um, patients, caregivers, policymakers, and other stakeholders. And we work together uh, as an international team. Women's Brain Project was founded in 2016 and the team has grown exponentially. And indeed this picture, I think uh, I used this two months ago and I'm sure that it's, uh, not so current anymore, because I'm sure there are a few more that are missing here from our team. Um, and what do we do? So our, our aim is to advocate for, promote, as well as do our own research and work to um, uh, talk about sex and gender differences um, 
in in health, so in various areas of health, and this varies goes from drug development, uh, prevention strategies, treatment, policies, AI and technology in healthcare, and, and many other topics in, in this area. So what we would like to, to say that our message is that we need to move from a one size fits all approach in health and go to an individualized approach, which we believe is the gateway to precision medicine and would be beneficial for everybody in society. So I, I cannot go into detail about us since I'm mindful of the time. So those of you who would like to read more can visit our website and please follow us on social media where we post regularly about our work and research. So before I start to talk about um, um, the psychosocial impact of the COVID pandemic and the, the, the gender differences that we see here, I would like to ask you, um, what comes to mind when you think about the impact of the pandemic on our mental health? And you can type in your answer on your mobile phone, uh, if you have your mobile phone next to you or your tablet or your iPad or open a, 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 another uh, window in your browser, um, go to menti.com, enter the code that you see on at the top of the slide and you can type in up to three words that you that comes to mind when you think of impact of COVID pandemic and mental health. Um, I'm interested in, in, your, in your thoughts about this. So the first answers are coming in and um, isolation, stress management, anxious, that's a key word that I will be using. Uh, a lot in, in the presentation. Depression, affect, resilience, coping. I see anxiety in, th in the middle. The larger the word, that means that more than one person has, has uh, submitted, submitted the word. Oh, misogynistic, interesting. Devastating. Mm -hmm. Testing on females. Okay, I'll wait a few more seconds and then I'll move on to my next slide. We will save this picture because I think it's very interesting. Um, it gives an overview of, of the general feeling during this pandemic. And unfortunately, most of it is negative and anxiety remains right there in the center, how huh? big and bold. Okay. Thank you for your answers. Separation from family, yes, that's relationships. Okay, we can talk a whole hour about this, but um, I just, I will be coming back to many of the points you mentioned here um, as I go on. So the general situation, um, sex and gender differences in mental health. In all studies, there's a consistent pattern where we see differences in the prevalence uh, of various mental health illnesses. So when we look, at, for example, at depression and anxiety, um, women are at a higher risk. So for example, um, when it comes to depression, one in four women will require treatment at some point in their lives, uh, while it's only one in 10 men who, who um, suffer from depression in their life. When it comes to anxiety, women are twice as likely to experience um, anxiety symptoms than men. Um, on the other hand, we see that when it comes to externalizing disorders and substance abuse, 
these are um, psychological disorders that tend to be more common in men. So what's happening now um, during the pandemic? So pre-pandemic, we had about one in 10 adults reporting symptoms of anxiety and depression. And obviously there were existing risk factors for mental health illnesses, and that included being female for a lot of illnesses. Um, low income is another risk factor, low education, as well as a history of psychiatric illness. And now during the pandemic, we see an increase in the frequency of reported symptoms of anxiety and depression. A report by Deloitte um, from Canada, they reported that, that four in 10 adults reported symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, there has always also been, uh, we have also observed an increase in visits to mental health professionals, as well as an increase in the prescription of antidepressants. And, Combined with the previous or existing risk factors, we now have more risk factors added on, one of which is what some of the audience mentioned, isolation. Um, the anxiety related to loss of income or loss of, of, of employment because of the measures of the pandemic. Inadequate or no information or inadequate access to information and healthcare. So these are all um, new risk factors that are emerging and compounding with the existing risk factors for mental health. And when we look at differences between men and women, we see that there is a gendered impact of COVID on mental health. And since I'm taking a psychosocial approach here, I'm looking at the socioeconomic um, impact of COVID, I will be talking mainly about gender differences. Um, we see um, in various studies, more women, a lot of women feel burnt out. There's a increase in, in depressive and anxiety disorders. Even before the pandemic, women were at a higher risk and now this risk is compounded. Isolation is another big factor. It is a risk factor for cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. And we know that there is a consistent pattern across countries where AD is more prevalent in women. Um, during the COVID pandemic, in various studies, um, we read that women report higher anxiety, depression, and loneliness than men. And then another point here is when we look at women from women of color or from other ethnic minorities, um, they kind of have a double double disadvantage here, or they um, where 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 they feel the impact of the pandemic from from various various aspects. I would like to talk about five groups uh, within the population that were particularly affected by the pandemic. And in all these groups, women are overrepresented. So we have people who have experienced a loss of income or even lost their jobs due to the pandemic, the frontline healthcare workers, informal caregivers or unpaid caregivers, victims of intimate partner violence, and then, Obviously here, women are overrepresented in the last group. It's women in the perinatal phase, that is pregnant women and mothers in the first year after birth, after the birth of their child. Um, and this causes a domino effect uh, in the sense that the pandemic has an effect on our employment, on our income, on our social contacts, on our work. Um, and this in turn has an effect on our mental health. So there is this domino effect um, that, that occurs. Let's start with the economic impact of COVID. We know on average women earn less than men and are more likely to live in poverty. Now, during the COVID pandemic, um, we have seen a huge impact on employment and income. Um, Deloitte even talk about a she session instead of a recession where women are overrepresented in job losses. Um, others, more surveys observe that more women are more likely to lose their jobs than men or be on leave of absence or on unpaid leave. Um, one of the reasons is that women tend to be overrepresented in the lockdown sectors. So um, they are more at risk to, to suffer this. Um, 
a report from Kinsey actually uh, presents their findings in a, in a very clear manner. They, they conducted the survey in the United States and they asked um, people whether they were considering downshifting their career due to the pandemic or leaving their job. And as you see in all or most of the cases, women tended to, to um, rate higher here, particularly women with children under 10 years old. So it shows um, which groups were more impacted by, by the effects of the pandemic, by the socioeconomic effects. Um, what, particularly um, workers considering leaving the workforce, we see that many more women than men were considering doing, doing so. Another group I would like to talk about are our healthcare healthcare workers. Um, in 2009, the World Health Organization um, published a report aptly titled Delivered by Women Led by Men, because 70% of the healthcare workforce is made up of women. Um, however, when it comes to leadership roles in healthcare, the majority uh, of the people in these roles are men. So we have Many women working on the front line, which may also partially explain why there are more women infected by COVID than men. And many studies, there have been very studies published last year in 2020 and the beginning of this year that reported that there is a higher rate of physicians burnout, for example, or of anxiety uh, amongst healthcare workers and women, particularly mothers, appear to be disproportionately affected by the situation. Um, so this is also um, a very concerning effect of the pandemic, which we need to uh, consider and address. When it comes to our caregivers, we do not only have the formal or paid caregivers, but also the informal caregivers. And usually these are family members who take care of other family members who are chronically or terminally ill. And across the uh, globe, in practically all countries, the majority of these caregivers are women. So we have about, depending on the country, between 60 to 75% of the informal caregivers are women. Uh, and now um, this is a role which already has a psychological impact. So uh, we, we talk about caregiver burnout, and various um, stress-related disorders. And now COVID-19 has amplified the impact of this role. Um, their caregivers experience more isolation. They also have to work from home perhaps, then homeschooling. There are various new challenges that informal caregivers need to, um, need to face. And here, once again, women are overrepresented in this group. So the next group I would like to talk about is intimate partner violence. The majority of victims are women. Not all victims are female, um, but the majority are. So, um, and we have seen that during the pandemic, especially during the lockdown period, um, there has been an increase in um, domestic violence, unfortunately. Uh, the United Nations uh, even called for a ceasefire uh, because they, observe this worldwide increase, the number of calls to helplines or other services doubled or even increased more. And uh, Evans uh, in, in their study even talked about a pandemic within the pandemic. And this new situation really requires innovative and individualized solutions to, uh, for, to help victims get access to, to help, notwithstanding the lockdown, the lack of social contact and the isolation. So this is very, very important. A last, the last group I would like to talk about are new moms and pregnant women. Um, there has been this, this report from Brigham and Women's Hospital who uh, stated that 
the, the pandemic may, may increase the risk of depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder amongst pregnant women and new moms. And indeed, uh, we know that the most common mental health disorder in women in the perinatal phase are mental health illnesses and the most mm, known um, illnesses postpartum or postnatal depression. And now during the pandemic, this anxiety has increased and the risk has increased due to isolation, due to the fear and anxiety related to infection. Uh, we hear a lot of pregnant women um, feeling anxious about whether their partner can be with them during the birth, for example, in hospital. So there are many new triggers that um, affect women at this time of their life in this phase. And uh, so it is very important. In fact, all studies conclude with a, with a plea to, to increase awareness, to make sure there is screening, notwithstanding lockdown, to, um, to identify, to, to diagnose uh, postpartum depression as early as possible and to provide psychosocial support through new uh, new media, new ways uh, to reach everyone who needs, who needs. And this brings us back full circle to what I was talking about, our work with Women's Brain Project. We, pro we advocate for innovative and individualized solutions, a precision medicine approach to address everybody's needs, men's, women's, and other, other groups within the population. Um, and in this way, improve health and quality of life for everybody. And in this way, we can stop the domino effect, hopefully, and, <laughs> and make life better for everyone. So I thank you for your attention, look forward to your questions, and thank you to um, Viviana for organizing this. Thank you, Anna Maria. It's really not me organizing it. It's the Hebrew University as a group, but uh, I'm very glad to be part of it. And uh, I will now present to you Maria Teresa Ferretti, who is co-founder and chief scientific, scientific officer of Women's Brain Project. She is a neuroimmunologist and science advocate over the past 10 years on the international field of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and uh, unique, she has a unique expertise in sex and gender differences. And so uh, in the treatment of COVID, Maria Teresa, uh, is there already the possibility to have different treatment for men and for women and uh, how uh, this difference should be? For example, one of the things uh, we know is the vaccine problem uh, that I don't believe was particularly tested on gender differences, if I'm not wrong. Thank you, Viviana, and thanks to the Hebrew University for co-hosting this event. Uh, this is really an important question, Viviana, and I hope I will provide some answers or at least some points for discussion together with you. Uh, and before I start, I thought maybe I can define why we keep talking about both sex and gender differences uh, to make it clear also to our audience, because when we're looking at differences between men and women, this can be due to biological factors. And that's what we have heard from Professor Hermona Sarek. Uh, so these are differences that are driven by the expression of sexual chromosomes, XX or XY in most cases. Uh, and the uh, expression of hormones. So you have a whole set of differences in health and disease that are due to biological uh, reasons. And then you have gender. And in this context, we are referring to gender, meaning the social cultural construct of being a man or a woman in a given society. And we heard a lot of examples of how important this can be because being a man or a woman in a society can affect basically your role, for instance, the caregiving, taking care of the family, access to jobs, education, and so on. And also these, the social cultural aspects uh, are determinants of health. And this has been defined by the WHO. So we are really interested in the Women's Brain Project in both. And I think we heard a, a very clear uh, explanation today of how both 
biological elements as well as, as social cultural elements are affecting this pandemic that we are, you know, th that it's in front of our eyes. So it has never been so clear as during this pandemic how important these factors are. So this is something that I would like to highlight because we are experiencing this huge tragedy because this is a tragedy. We are hopefully coming out of it, but it's, it's still uh, really something uh, difficult to tackle. And as a scientist uh, and as an advocate, I, I, my message is really to try and learn lessons. What can we learn out of this pandemic that can help us improve in, in public health in general? And actually reconnecting to what uh, Viviana, you were saying at the very beginning, there are so many things we don't understand. And I think with this pandemic, it has become clear how every person is different. I think we have all experienced this thing of uh, one person that is sick in the family, and for some reason, some, uh, some of the relatives get the virus, are infected, and some others not, all living together in the same house. So why the virus infects people in different ways, we still don't understand. Why even when you have a person that is infected with a virus, and you have another one, these two people can have completely different uh, symptoms. You can have one that is asymptomatic, doesn't even realize has a virus, and another person with severe symptoms requiring hospitalization, worst case scenario, even death. So I think we have understood quite a lot of things about this virus, but these things, we, we are still not there yet. Imagine how powerful it would be if we would know what are the characteristics of a person that makes this person susceptible to, to be infected by the virus. Imagine how powerful the measures for containment of the virus could be. Imagine how powerful it would be if we, if we knew what characteristics, what risk factors, um, will determine the progression of the disease once a person is infected. And so we could have already all sorts of prevention and also follow up and specific therapies for people that are at high risk. And there are some elements that we are starting to understand. And I think it's striking how much sex and gender, but in particular in, at this level, let's talk about sex differences, uh, have actually been shown to impact uh, the, the outcome of the disease. Um, we, we are starting to understand um, the differences in terms of uh, risk factors, in terms of biomarkers, so how the, uh, the uh, certain, uh, especially immune um, uh, reactions are different in men and women, the progression of the disease that is so different between uh, men and women because we have seen uh, that actually this, the, the disease is more severe in men and requires more often ICU and uh, unfortunately leads more often to death in men and the response to treatment. And I think this one, to answer your question, Viviana, this is really the $1 million question because it is something that we should really carefully consider in terms of side effects and in terms of efficacy. Because, um, and I'm sure Hermona here uh, will uh, have a lot to say as well, but it is very well known that vaccines work differently between men and women. So I really think understanding the individual characteristics of people to manage this whole pandemic will be key. And one of the factors that really drive this variability and, and heterogeneity in the patients is actually sex and gender. Thank you. I, I am wondering why uh, the vaccine has not be, has been, it has been tested by age and not by sex. Why is this? We are looking into that, um, Viviana, right now. So uh, normally, the regulators uh, require a stratification of data by age and by sex. So we are going through the literature right now th through the medical reviews to, to have a look at that. Um, and um, we are hoping to actually yeah, have the full evidence uh, for you soon. But right now I don't have a, a direct answer. I think these data have been looked at, uh, but I know that is never a focus of the drug developers. And that's exactly the message that I would like to give today, that this is not a nuance, a, a nuisance. This is not a side thing that nobody is interested about. It's something that if you don't consider it has profound implications for public health. Uh, and so let me go to this one. This is actually exactly coming to your point, uh, Viviana. This is the GAO report. Uh, and it was a report done uh, by the United States General Accounting Office in 2001, looking at drugs that have been withdrawn from the market because of severe side effects. Um, so in this case, this study revealed that out of 10 drugs that were withdrawn from the market, out of, so there were 10, eight out of 10 were withdrawn because of severe side effects that affected more women than men. And 
so th there was a, of course, a public debate on this. And what turned out is that the problem here was that for a very long time, women were excluded from clinical trials at very early stages of uh, testing. And this was done to protect them. The idea was to protect fertile women uh, to avoid effects in, during a, a potential pregnancy. And so it was meant in a good way, but it backfired because by excluding women from this early stage of development of drugs, what happened was that we created a gap, a knowledge gap. So we did not know the safety profile of these drugs in women. And we found it out only when the, the drug hit the market in pharmacovigilance stage, which is a little bit too late. So since then, things have changed. FDA had realized and, and all the regulators realized that this could not be. So now women are included in clinical trials and the data are analyzed by sex and gender. However, I think we are still not, I, I, I think there is still a lot of work to do to convince drug developers and regulators that this is really an important thing. And I think right now with the vaccines and the side effects, we might be seeing something like that um, because we, we, it is known the side effects tend to be more severe in, uh, in women than men with vaccines. And it seems to be the case also with, uh, with this one. So, it's, it's these sex differences are really something you do not want to uh, overlook during drug development. And I think we are seeing it right now. And this is a bit of a take home message slide that I wanted to show you because we really think the way um, we are um, developing medicines right now and, and performing medicine at large is, is really what uh, Eric Topol called shallow medicine. So an example of shallow medicine is uh, the fact that there are a lot of the drugs that we use. So these are the 10 highest drugs so sold in US. Actually, for many, many people, they do not work to be very honest. So if you take an example of Copaxon for multiple sclerosis, out of 16 people that receive this drug, you see only one little man that is blue. And that means that there is only one person that is actually having a clinical benefit out of this drug. The other ones, will take the drug, they will pay for the drug or the insurer or the state will pay for the drug. They will not get any benefit out of it. Most likely they will get some side effects. So this is very common, especially in, in uh, psychiatric and neurology that you, you get a diagnosis and then the doctor tries one drug and then you see how it goes and then maybe it doesn't work and you receive another drug and it can take years before you find the drug that works. This is really not sustainable. And this is because we are not able to understand before to predict who will respond to which drug. So we think this is not sustainable and we think we should move towards precision medicine. Uh, and again, I think now with the COVID pandemic, we have an example of how powerful this would be. Uh, we don't have it for COVID, but we have it for oncology, for breast cancer, for instance. And I'm a breast cancer survivor, so I can tell you really firsthand how powerful this is. Uh, from a patient perspective. So as a, as a cancer patient, the doctor will never consider two patients as being equal. So every patient will be fully characterized with an array of biomarkers and different indicators and features so that they can actually define what is your, the subtype of your cancer. And at that point, you can be uh, given the right, um, so the therapeutic choice and the, uh, deciding in terms of surgery, treatment, follow-up, uh, and so on and so forth. And this very specific and tailored approach has determined an, a, an incredible improvement in the quality of life of patients and the, um, the survival, of course, but also really quality of life and reduction of cost. So I think if we have done it for oncology, we should be doing it for everything. And right now with COVID, I think this is a great example of how powerful this approach could be. But for that, we have to come to the, to the conclusion, we have to accept that not all patients are identical. Patients are different. There are different characteristics. And so we really want to, to send this message out there to say that COVID is really a chance to understand that one size fits all approach will not work. Uh, and um, I, I'm, I hope that this is our chance to really implement new uh, ideas and new methodologies as well towards precision medicine, where we consider every patient um, individually and we consider the specific characteristics of the patient. And both sex, both biology and gender, socioeconomic factors will have an impact. So eventually we will have to consider all of them, but it will really be for the benefit of the, the entire uh, society. And I would like to thank you for, for your attention, for listening. I invite you again to follow the Women's Brain Project on social media. And this is Brain Awareness Week. And I also invite you to join our campaign, Be Brain Powerful, which raise awareness on uh, lifestyle changes that we can all do 
to take agency over our brain health and uh, reduce the risk of uh, brain disorders. Thank you very much, Maria Teresa. There are some questions. I think we still have a few minutes. Uh, one question from Aaron Levitt is, if we are headed to individualized medicine, what is the basic information we must know of the individual being treated? Well, I think that Maria Teresa answered much of that. You need to approach every person with careful checkup and you definitely need to know whether there are men or women and you need to appreciate the age and you need to follow the reaction to treatment individually. And that would cost a lot, which is probably why it is not happening yet for diseases that are not uh, endangering our survival in the immediate manner like cancer. This is what I was thinking. It is a total revolution in the medical system, yeah. which is now very impersonal in most places, especially where there is public health. Uh, there is another question. Uh, it's about the willingness to look for psychological help uh, if it affects the difference in mental health problem between women and men. Are women more used to look for mental help? Um, if I may answer this question. Um, so obviously we also have the effect of uh, gender stereotypes and gendered norms. So uh, in the typical, in most culture, there are these stereotypes of men being strong and not complaining and, and being able to take pain. And, and, you know, we even in our language, in the language we use, we have expressions like, come on, man up, you know, uh, be a man or... Uh, so, and on the other hand, women uh, in the olden times, you know, like hysteria, for example, was associated with women. So on the one hand, there is the phenomenon um, or something to consider that men may not be reporting symptoms, but that does not mean that they don't have the symptoms. So that, that, that's one side. But on the other side, we have also studies that show that uh, sometimes when it comes to patient-doctor communication, women are not taken so seriously. And this is not only in the case of mental illness. We have studies that show, for example, in cardiology, uh, when women and men with the same symptoms, men are more likely to be referred to a cardiologist than women, for example. Um, so then there is this other side where maybe women, okay, they, they talk about their symptoms, but they are not taken so seriously. So there are there is also this there are these factors, gender stereotypes, gender norms, societal expectations of how we should behave, as well as awareness and education about mental health. Thank you. Well, there was one study that we looked at recently is the countries that, that has, have women heading them had a much more prudent and, and, and better approach to COVID than the one where men, uh, and I'm thinking of New Zealand, Germany, and other countries who took very good care of the policies anti-COVID while countries headed by men, especially macho men like Trump and Bolsonaro and Johnson took a very uh, bad approach uh, and did not care so much about prevention. So this might be also a, a feminine approach to, to medicine, uh, to be more careful. We are used to have children, to protect our children. And so I think that this is part of a woman's approach, maybe not genetic, but certainly epigenetic. Now, uh, we are almost at the closing time. I would like to know if any of you has something to add or to ask each other questions. Um, Viviana, we have a question from uh, Claudia Vaccarone. I will open her microphone. Mm -hmm. Claudia, you should open your microphone too. No, so let's let's go. Sorry, on. mistake. But there is a Cholden who says all the members of Dr. Atsil team are women. The four presenters today are all women. Where are the men? Hi, uh, so um, 
where are the men really uh, studying mother infant bonding i am i'm missing some uh, applications from male students and i'm welcoming them um, uh, i encourage you to apply if you're out there um, but more seriously, uh, if you look at panels in the scientific world and in, you know, everywhere, um, women are um, unrepresented um, in a very uh, dramatic way. Um, and so we're just balancing out um, a little bit um, this uh, statistics. Um, so. But I, I, if I may add, Shir, it's also possible that men are less interested in precision medicine because medicine is catered to them. So I think that women are interested in bringing the, the point out because they are really not considered in the studies for medicine. So we are you know, showing and, and, and doing it for our own interest, which is very good that we finally can do it. But uh, may I say something that you all know, uh, that what you are saying that women are misrepresented in uh, convention and seminar and forums. Uh, I notice myself, I organize these things that uh, maybe 90% of speakers are, um, are men and 10% and when we are lucky are women. And uh, why? Uh, it looks as if there are no women. No, in the field, there are incredibly good women heading labs, uh, having incredible backgrounds. Uh, so I think that it is the fact that uh, I, I see myself as a journalist. You know, we tend to interview people who are already famous. So it's very hard to become famous if nobody brings you in light. And, and it's still what we call the uh, ceiling of glass, the glass ceiling that women can get up, but they cannot get the visibility. So we are organizing a, a seminar in seven cities, uh, having only women uh, as speakers. And uh, we are doing it with the Hebrew University. The first event will be October 17, 2021, hopefully in presence. And I want to say that I really invite all the men to come <laughs> and to applaud. <laughs> okay, uh, Claudia Vaccaroni says, thank you for this brilliant and very informative session. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you all for being here. And unless somebody else has something to say, I think we can finish in the perfect time. I think we all owe you special thanks, Viviana. No, thank you to all of you. It was really a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I hope we'll meet soon again for more seminars with a lot of women present. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you, Mara. Bye. And thank you, Francine. And thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all Bye. of you. It was great to organize this with you. Yeah. Play it out. <laughs>